Hello and welcome to episode number 17 of the Landscape Photography Show. I'm Cara Riley, one of the curators of the Landscape Photography theme page. And today we have some exciting guests. We have uh, Mark Johnson, who is a Photoshop luminary. I, we're so excited to have Mark. He's the author of many, many ebooks. He has worked through the Rocky Mountain School of Photography, Radiant Vista, Boulder Digital Arts. He's lectured in front of you can't believe this, Adobe's Chief Executive Officers, Jane Goodall. It just goes on. He's been in Finland, Academy Award winning director. He, he just is going to be able to share with us many great ideas about Photoshop. And I'm going to introduce our panel. This is Je Mark is our guest speaker. And then here we go with our panel. We've got Mike Berenson. Tell us where you're from, Mike. Littleton, Colorado. Great. And uh, Mike does, specializes in night lens uh, photography. Then we have Crystal Craft, the unofficial ambassador for Denver and real estate entrepreneur. Plus, she is the coordinator for a 1,400 member photo group. Crystal, tell us a little bit. Uh, about the photo group, um, it's really pretty cool. We have um, lots of instructors that come and do classes for us, so we're able to fill that up, and then we do photo walks. You know, Mike Berenson is one of the people that um, helps us out, so it's really great for members of all skill levels. Great, great. And now we're going to Montana with David Marks, who's a, a Lightroom luminary and uh, having some great uh, fall color um, tours soon. Mark, David, tell us how people can find you, too. Uh, well, I'm easy to find um, at davidmarks.com, and um, uh, it's, it's such a pleasure to be here and, and to watch Mark. He's one of my favorites to teach, and, and to meet Mike, whose uh, night photography I've, I've been following uh, past couple months here on Google Plus. Great, and now we have a Britta Roge from Berlin, Germany, and we're so excited to be able to connect globally. Um, Britta is has a photography theme page called Show Your Best Work, and uh, Britta, tell us a little bit about you and what else you do professionally. Hi, I'm Ruta from Berlin. Um, my profession is web design, and um, yes, I have the theme, Show Us Your Best Work, and for the um, theme, I produce the website, showusyourbestwork.com, and it will be a pleasure if you visit the page, the website, too. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Britta. So... Uh, now, here we, we want to thank all of you who are watching, who participated in this event, uh, this the episode 17, where you shared your Photoshop edited photos. They were absolutely amazing. And so, as a special treat, we're, we have our show starters. And I'm going right here to the show starters. Um, that we we have and Mike, we're going to start with the one that you've selected um, uh, and tell us about VCM photography Kenneth Lee. Why did you like it and select it? You bet. I, I was drawn to this right away by the the, the deep late light in it. It cast a lot of um, warm shadows on the structures and that really drew me in. I really like long exposures and it looks to me like this is, is a long exposure because it really the water surface is all smoothed out and I just I'm drawn into it. I'm, I'm kind of curious about how it was taken. What was the technique behind it? And I'm not looking for answers right now but whenever I have questions that are raised about how an image was taken, what, what is this? What is this portion? Uh, all of a sudden that raises mystery and, and it, it engages me and it pulls me in and, and this picture definitely does that. Oh, that's awesome. And um, just a side note, uh, if you go back, if whoever's listening to the event, they actually are talking about how they did it, all of the photographers, 
And he was in four and a half feet of water. But I'm going to move on now. We're going to go to the next one. Uh, uh, the next shot is um, Grant Galbraith. And uh, I selected this one. And the reason I selected it is because he actually explained in his um, post how he went to um, Photoshop and use the Creative Cloud, and I think that the, uh, it, it is, it's called Russell, Russell Brown is the um, tool that he used to create this. So Grant, thank you, great, great addition to our um, event. So, now Britta, you, you selected Gary Sindel's. Yes, I liked it. I selected Gary Sindel. I, in, in this photo, I especially like um, the mood in the morning light. I like the reflection in the river. I like um, how it changing the um, season, the warm color of brown and opposite of the blue color, of the cold blue color. Um, Yes, everything Thank is you. changing in this snow. We were picture. Talking in the room. You like the snow too. It did, it does show the transition beautifully. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mark, you selected Annalise. The first thing I'd like to say is that all these photos that have been coming up are just absolutely beautiful and uh, evocative. This one uh, from Annalise, I selected this because it's just so serene and creates this. Uh, beautiful feeling in me when I look at the image. Um, the orange color in the sky there, I don't know if anybody else has seen it, but it kind of reminds me of a cream sickle. <laughs> I don't know if you're picking that up, but uh, that's kind of the feeling I get around that. And I love the way Annalise has framed this scene with the uh, tree branches, almost like they're vignetting. And then I, it looks as though she's done some work. I don't know if it was with a gradient or um, some sort of dodging and burning, where she's also dark in the bottom. So in this scene, I find that my eye just continues to rove around within the scene itself, and it's not spilling out of any of the edges here. I also am intrigued by the road that leads back into the scene. I think in my perfect world, it would actually curve the other direction. But um, nonetheless, I find that, uh, that it's a road that I wish I was walking or riding on. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Mark. I know Annalise will appreciate that. And uh, Crystal, you selected this one by Tony Hayward. I want to go here. <laughs> it just <laughs> looks so wonderful. I love the, um, the shale layers and the water, how it's so smooth and um, clear. And then the colors, you know, the complementary colors contrasting. and It almost looks like there's gold in the water. It does. It does. Yeah. We were talking about that in the green room. That it really does look like gold in the water. So, um, so we're we're good to go here. So now, the, I again the thank you to absolutely everyone who submitted a photo to our event. Um, we loved looking at them and continue to engage sharing how you created whatever it is that you had and posted. So now I'm going to turn the show over to Mark and Mark Johnson, Mark S. Johnson Photography is going to share three photographs with us uh, on how to process. So this actually is turning into a workshop on how to create three different images through Photoshop. And I know from myself, I haven't done editing outside editing. So this is just a wonderful learning opportunity for me. And we have our panel who are very experienced. So as they bring questions or, or things in, this is, this is going to be a wonderful learning experience, Mark. And thank you for taking your time today to share your love and passion of Photoshop with us. Well, it is my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Tara, for inviting me onto the show. And it's also a pleasure to be uh, with a panel of awesome people uh, like we have right here. So just feel real lucky to be here. And um, I want to use this opportunity to um, share my passion for post-processing. Uh, for me, personally, I really see Photoshop as just as an extension of my creative self. So um, the camera is kind of the first half of the process and Photoshop is where I go from there. 
So b between the camera and Photoshop, I find that I'm able to actually convey uh, my own vision uh, or perhaps the feeling that I felt when I was uh, capturing that image. And so that's where I want to take all of you today. And I'm going to share my screen here and show you where we are headed. All right, so uh, time permitting, we're going to talk about how to create uh, a photo composite like the one you see right here. We're also going to look at a luminous oil painting effect like the one that you see here. And we're going to do um, a uh, photo montage where we're going to blend a texture with an image. I don't have that example right here in front of me, but we're going to do those three things today. And we're going to begin with this, um, this um, composite that I have right here. Uh, this is an image that um, generated a lot of discussion um, and I think a lot of interest. People are curious about how you do something like this. And so I want to take you through the steps to do this. And I should also mention that I have a lot of great um, kind of follow-up resources associated with everything that I teach on my website. And I know Cara is going to post that information with the show notes. So I'm going to begin here. I've got um, this shot. This is Ventura Beach, California. And then I have this image here of a doorway that I thought, you know, I was just wondering to myself, I, I put this composite together years ago, and I was just wondering, you know, what would happen if I tried to drop a doorway onto a beach, you know? What sort of um, mood would that evoke in people? And so I, I gave it a shot. So I've got these two images selected right here in Bridge, and I'm just going to choose Tools, Photoshop, and I'm going to load these files into Photoshop layers. So it's going to create one layered Photoshop document that contains both of those images. And you can layer in as many images as you want um, in a situation like this. All right, so as you can see here, I've got my beach on the top layer and the doorway on the bottom layer. So I want to restack the deck here. I'll just drag this top layer down below the doorway layer and let go. All right. I'm going to make this just uh, for anybody listening, um, th this photo was in last week's uh, episode 16 for the landscape photography and had many, many people commenting on it. So we're really excited that you're sharing this, Mark. Yeah, yeah, well, do it. I'm, I'm enjoying doing it. So I'm, I'm going to take this doorway layer here and I'm going to reposition it. And that means I'll, I'll grab the move tool here, which is the top tool, and drag it wherever I want it, and I can reposition it at any point in time. So I think I might want it maybe in this region here. Now, something that's so beautiful about Photoshop is it, it has something called layer mask. And layer mask allow you to hide selective parts of a layer. And you do that by adding a mask and then filling the areas that you don't want to see with black paint. And so right, what I'm going to do right now is I am going to make a selection of this doorway and when I add a mask because I made the selection first Photoshop is going to automatically know that I want to preserve what's inside the selection and hide what is not. So I'm going to go over here to the polygonal lasso tool and this is like connecting the dots. So I'm going to go ahead and click right here and you see it's like I've stepped in some gum and it's just dragging out right here now I'm going to click right up here, move over to this spot, and each time I want to drop a point down, I just click. So I'll continue to click around this until I come back to here. I'm near my starting point, and when you're near your starting point, you can either connect in with the starting point, or you can simply double click, and it will draw a straight line between where you double click and where you started making the selection. All right? Now I just want to check in with everybody. Uh, so far, is all this all this clear? Because feel free to ask questions if you have them. We're going to lasso up the what we want to keep. I That's like right. That. That's right. So we just <laughs> use the polygonal lasso to lasso up what we want to keep. Now I'm going to add a mask by clicking on the front loading washing machine icon that you see right down here. <laughs> oh, so when it. I click on this icon, <laughs> it's going to preserve the door. That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to preserve the door and it's going to hide everything that's around it. So now we have this doorway sitting on a beach and it's interesting but it doesn't look very realistic yet 
and that's just because we haven't done the finishing touches. So one thing we're going to do here is um, we're going to make the edges of the door look consistent with other edges in the frame, which means instead of having these really Oops. A little bit. And to soften edges, there's a sweet little trick. You can come here to the mask, make sure that it is activated, and you know your mask is activated when you see the little white photo corners around it. So with the mask activated, I'm going to choose Select Refine Mask. This brings us into this fantastic dialogue with so much potential. Here's the view menu, and the first thing I'm going to do is make sure that I'm viewing this on layers, which means that I'm viewing the doorway actually as it sits on top of the beach. So I'm actually seeing my photo composite exactly as it's going to turn out. Now since the edges are a little bit hard and I need to soften them up, I'll slide right down here to the feather slider. And I'll crank, I'm going to crank it too far to the right so you can see what happens. Is everybody seeing how that's softening the edge right there? Well, I don't want to go that far but I do want a slightly softer edge, so I'll do something maybe like that. All right, so I have a slightly softer edge, and I want to output this, meaning I want to save this modification directly to the layer mask. So here where it says output to, I'm going to choose layer mask and press OK. Now I want to show you, here is the mask a moment ago, and here it is now. Can you see the difference? Let me zoom that even a little closer probably a little bit hard to see. Here's a moment ago, and here's now. Does everybody see the subtle softening that occurred right there, the feathering of the edge? Are you guys still there? Yes. <laughs> We're still here. Yeah, just, just, checking, <laughs> still here buddy. just checking in, since I can't see you and I didn't hear you, I'm thinking, hey, maybe I'm lecturing to myself, which you know, it's <laughs> weird, it happens all the time, I don't know why. <laughs> all right, so I've got the Real, more realistic edge, the one that looks more consistent with this particular scene. Now, if the door were actually sitting on that beach, water would be rushing back down the beach into the doorway, the open doorway here. And so I am going to modify the mask further, and this time, instead of working with a selection, I am going to paint with a black brush, which is probably the most common way you'll, you'll modify a mask in Photoshop. You just grab a, a brush, you paint with black. So as long as the mask is active, you can now click on the brush tool, and you can set black as the foreground color, which since I have white and black in here already, I'm just going to swap them by clicking on the arrow that you see here, and that brings black up to the foreground. When you paint, you're always painting with the foreground color. Now I'm going to make the brush bigger using the number one keyboard shortcut that you can learn in Photoshop is the bracket keys. The right bracket key makes your brush incrementally larger and the left bracket key makes it incrementally smaller. So I'm going to tap the right bracket key and now I'm going to paint right in here and I notice, I'm going to undo that for a moment, I notice I'm painting with 60% opacity. I actually want to be at 100% opacity. So I'm going to either scrub over the word opacity here and go to the right to change that value to 100, or a nice keyboard shortcut is you can tap 0 and it will set your uh, brush to 100%, or 9 will set it to 90% and so on and so forth. All right, so I'm going to paint over this and make it appear as though the water is kind of rushing in through that doorway. Now I also want to make my brush smaller, so I'll use the left bracket key for that. I'm going to paint right up here so it looks like the water is kind of bending around the edge of that uh, door frame. And same thing here. All right, so does it look like water is kind of pushing into that scene a little bit? Sure does. Yeah. All right. On that again, here's, here's the mask now. So you can see by adding that black paint, I simply hid parts of that layer, of the door layer. All right, now, if we really want to make this look realistic, then we need to introduce a reflection because we have a reflective surface there with the shining water. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this doorway layer and I'm going to 
duplicate it. Um, and you could do that with layer, duplicate layer, or the keyboard shortcut that I find myself using uh, day in and day out to duplicate a layer is Command-J on the Mac or Control-J on the PC. So I'll do a Command-J. I now have a duplicate of the layer right here. I want to flip this over so that it looks like a reflection. So I'm going to choose Edit, Transform, Flip Vertical. And then I'm going to grab the Move tool again and drag that down here so that it becomes, starts to become um, a reflection. Now, I know that reflections are supposed to um, mirror directly below the, the subject, the doorway here, but um, after playing around with this, I thought it looked a little bit better if I angled the reflection off to the side. So I'm going to show you how to do that. First thing I'm going to do, since this is going to be um, a change that um, I may want to reverse at some point in time. I'm going to come up here to filter and choose convert for smart filters. And convert for smart filters turns this layer into something called a smart object, which means that basically all the filtering changes that I'm about to do and even the transform changes I'm about to do can be reversed. They're non-destructive. So uh, it gives me a lot of creative freedom when I do that. So I'm going to come here and choose Edit, Transform, and Perspective. So Edit, Transform, Perspective. And that's going to allow me to distort that by grabbing the center bottom handle here and dragging this over like this. And then I can even make it a little bit wider at this end by holding down the Option key on Mac or Alt on PC and Again, I don't know if that's the way reflections actually look, but it's the way I like it. And as the artist, I get to, I get the freedom of making that choice. So I'm just positioning it in there a little bit. I'm going to play around with it some more and, and do a few more things that are going to make it look even more realistic. But for now, I'll tap Return on the Mac or Enter on the PC, and that will commit the change or the transformation that I just made. Now you can see that up here it's overlapping a little bit. So um, who out there can tell me, how would I hide... Um, this area that's overlapping here. What do you use to hide part of a layer in Photoshop? Mask. Mask, yeah. So I'll come back to the front-loading washing machine icon right here, grab the brush, and I can paint that area away if I want. Just like that. Okay? All right, now, if this were actually a reflection, a reflection, it would probably not be that intense. So I'm going to come here to the opacity for this layer and reduce it. And again, I'm going to scrubby slide right over top of this opacity word right here and back down the opacity for the reflection so that we have something more like that. All right. Wow. I'm also going to move it, so I'll come back to the Move tool, but this time I want to move in very subtle increments. So instead of clicking and dragging it around, I'll just use the arrow keys. So I'm using the right arrow key to move it to the right, the down arrow key here to drop it down a little bit, so it's, it's looking really good here. There's one more thing that we can do. Actually, there's lots of things we could do, but one thing, the last thing I'm going to do right now um, on this is I'm actually going to try to add a little bit of ripple to it because um, since it's sitting on an area where the water may not be even, so the reflective surface is not even, a little bit of ripple might be nice here. So we're going to choose Filter, Filter Gallery, and in the Filter Gallery you can have all sorts of fun I'm going to go ahead and make this 50% so we can see it a little bit better. I've selected one here under Distort called Ocean Ripple. And Ocean Ripple will reproduce the look of um, ripples in the ocean. So I'm just going to play around with the ripple size and the magnitude here until I have something that looks reasonably good. Uh, if I were actually working on this on my own, I'd spend a whole lot of time making sure I have all the settings dialed in. But that looks pretty good to me right there. So I'll press OK. And let me zoom this in just so you can see it. So can you see the little bit of ripple that's happening here within the reflection? And I think that brings a nice uh, level of authenticity to the reflection right there. So let me zoom just So now that it's zoomed back, you can see that we have, um, we have 
a, a wonderful composite. We used our imagination to create something um, from two different photos here. Does anybody have any any thoughts or any questions about this before I move on to the next uh, technique? I just well, want to say that I just want to say that <clears throat> from a, a small business and consulting standpoint, that being able to do something like this really does tell a story. And that people uh, today, when they're sharing their di digital images, can see how they can tell their story, whether that's walking out to, to the beach or, or taking your thoughts up higher. Um, it's really, really great, Mark, that you can show us just how simple it is with Photoshop to create that story. And I, I sincerely appreciate the time you've taken to do this. Sure. Mike, did you have something to say, too? Yeah, I, I just really like being able to see it come to life from the, you mentioned that it's the finishing touches that make a difference, and seeing that from the time that you first drop the door on the beach, and it doesn't look, it looks a little out of place at that point, but it's the finishing touches that really make it fit right in, and seeing that happen before our eyes is very powerful, so I appreciate your being able to share that too, with us. Yeah. yeah, well, thank you. It's my pleasure. I am... Um, Compositing is really a big thing for me. I just I, I get such a charge out of um, being able, as I mentioned earlier, to kind of convey these ideas or these emotions or these these thoughts that I'm having. And compositing is a great way for me to do that. And so, if you check out my Google Plus stream, you'll see a whole bunch of composites that I've been creating over the past couple of years. And um, and if you go to my website. Uh, you'll find a lot of resources, many of them free. Some of them are uh, premium uh, tutorial series that, that cost money. Uh, but I go into great detail about how to composite. So for anybody who's out there that might be interested in learning how to um, do all of these finishing touches that Mike talked about, uh, I have that information available right on my site. So uh, don't feel like you're an island and you can't get to the information. It's it's totally available. Uh, all right, I'm going to close yeah. I was going to say one of the things I love so much about your photography is is what you said a little while ago about I'm the artist, I get to put the reflection here or I can bend it in an angle that it might not naturally be. I love your uh, uh, your sense that the image is yours to control and to work and that it's it's yours to make it what you want. I think that's so so um, inspiring. Yeah, and, and empowering, you know, to, to be able to uh, create an image just the way you want to create it. And, you know, you're, you're probably going to, uh, you're probably going to have a lot of people who will really respond in a positive way to that image because they can see that you created something from, you know, within your artist's soul. Uh, and, and, of course, there will always be some people who say, well, hold on, it's not supposed to do that, or it's not supposed to look like that, and that's okay. Everybody's entitled to be, you know, their own opinion, to be in, being in their own place. But uh, what matters here is that you're being true to your own artistic spirit. So thanks for um, all those great comments, guys. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next technique. And while you're moving, I'll just introduce Jeff Boudot. Jeff? Got here and, and uh, well, my blue box isn't working. Hi, Jeff. And um, uh, I don't know why it's uh, changing to your uh, profile pic, but um, he's one of our landscape photographer curators, and now he's uh, back in with us. Thanks, Jeff. And here we go. Mark, Mike, Mark is yeah. all ready. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Jeff. It's it's great to have you here. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Mark. I've already learned something just in the first five minutes. It's great. <laughs> All right. It's been worthwhile. <laughs> Yay. Okay. So what I'm going to show you right now is um, a, a technique for creating a luminous oil painting look in any image that you have. I do find that this technique works best when you have subjects with lots of fine details, such as fall foliage or a meadow of wildflowers or anything that has a lot of beautiful fine details and some nice contrast, you know, with the uh, between the various elements in the scene. So I'm going to show you a super straightforward approach to turning this into an oil painting, and then I'm going to back up and I'm going to show you um, a little more sophisticated approach that's going to give you a similar but different look. So I'm going to I'm going to show you both of these. The first one is so straightforward that I think even new users to Photoshop will be fired up about what they can do Yay! in terms of creating an oil painting. <laughs> Yeah, so um, 
all right, I'm going to run a filter on this. And when I think about running a filter, I like to do it non-destructively so I can um, be as creative as I want and change my mind. So I'm going to choose filter, convert for smart filters. And that's turning this layer into a smart object. All right, now I'm going to um, go up here to the filter menu in Photoshop CC, which is the latest version, or CS6, you're going to find the oil paint filter right here in the filter menu. If you have a previous version, then you have to use a plugin called the Pixel Bender um, oil paint filter. And I have a tutorial on my site for that as well. So those of you who aren't in CS6 or CC, then uh, you still have access. Just go to my site and type in keywords Pixel Bender. All right, so now I'm in the oil paint filter. I'm going to zoom this to 50% magnification. That will really show you what's going on in here. Wow. Um, anybody who likes an oil paint effect, look, look what I have right off the bat. Yeah. Now I have six sliders here that I can use to play around with this. So I can control the exact look of oil paint that I like. And I sometimes have a hard time choosing because I like a lot of the different looks in here. But on this particular image, I'm going with, for something that has really uh, got this just stylized look. You know, long beautiful, broad, flowing strokes. And so I'm just going to play around with these sliders just for a moment. Um, explaining them, I could, I could try to do that. Uh, I don't think I'd do the best job of explaining them. They're just six sliders. Move them radically. You're going to very quickly get a sense of what each one does, and it's, you're going to be able to very quickly see what you like as well. See, so look at the depth it gives. When you go to Shine, you see how it's giving this dimension uh, which is true to a lot of like dense, heavy oil paints. So you can create just this stunning look just by converting to a smart object, which even that step is optional, and then going to filter oil paint, and you have something like this. Now, since I converted to a smart object, this was applied as a smart filter, which comes with a mask. So I can click right here on this white rectangle which represents the mask for the oil paint filter. I can put these little white photo corners around it by clicking on it and now I can choose the brush. I've got black as the foreground, 100% opacity. If I don't want the oil paint, or point, or oil paint effect somewhere, I can simply grab the brush, make it my right bracket there, and then I can paint over the road and I'm removing the oil paint effect from this area by painting with black on the mask. So now I have a photo combined with an oil painting. And I did that in all of a couple minutes, and anybody can do that. So I'm going um, I'm to actually make a snapshot of this so we can compare it with what I'm about to show you. So I'll go into the history panel where you can essentially store a moment in time as a snapshot. And that means I'm going to come down to this little camera icon that you see down here, and I'm going to click on it, and that creates a snapshot, which is a stored moment in time. Now I'm going to revert this image back to its original state just by clicking on the name of the original file here in the history panel, and I've reverted it back to its original state, so I can do something else with it. All right, here's what I'm going to do. This is going to um, take oil painting one step further. First thing I'll do to this image is I'm going to give it... Uh, an effect that I call a soft glow montage. And soft glow montage gives it an ethereal, nostalgic, dreamlike look. And it's going to do that to any image. Again, images with lots of fine details seem to work best for this. So in order to do that, I know I'm going to be darkening the picture. So I want to start the process by overexposing it a little bit, which you can do in Adobe Camera Raw, or if you're using Lightroom, you can overexpose in Lightroom so that when you show up in Photoshop, you're already overexposed. But I didn't begin this process in ACR or Lightroom. Right now, you see I have an image in Photoshop. So a real nice way to overexpose it very quickly is to add a Levels Adjustment layer in Screen Blend Mode. And you can do that very quickly by holding down Option on the Mac or Alt on the PC and click on, on right here the Levels icon in the Adjustments panel. All right, now I want to change the blend mode from normal to screen. And when I press OK, watch what happens to the photo. It overexposes. Now, I don't want it to overexpose so far that it's blowing out the, high, the, white, um, the white detail. 
And so I'm going to come in here to my history, or sorry, my histogram panel, and change the channel from colors to luminosity. And I can see if there's a right spike, or a spike on the right hand side, that I've blown out a few highlights. And I don't want to do that. So the way to fix that up quickly is to go back into the layers panel and just reduce the opacity of the levels layer until the right spike drops off of this histogram. I still have a little a mountain right there, but it's not actually touching the right-hand side. So I know that I have highlights that are very bright right now, but because the, the spike isn't kissing the right-hand side of the histogram, the whites are not blown out. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So now that I've got an um, overexposed image, I want to turn these two layers into one merged layer that sits on top. And the way you do that is you hold down Option on the Mac or Alt on the PC, and you choose Layer Merge Visible. So you choose Layer Merge vis Visible, and it will smush these two layers into one composite layer that you have right here. Now, I am going to put this layer in a beautiful blend mode called Multiply, which gives us the opportunity to simulate having two slides stacked together on a light table where one of the slides is in focus and one is out of focus. So I'm going to change the blend mode here from normal to multiply, which is going to naturally darken. That's why we brightened in the first place because of this darkening effect that occurs here. And now we're going to blur it, but we want to do that non-destructively, so we will convert first to a smart object. So we'll choose filter, convert for smart filters, and now we're going to blur using filter, blur, Gaussian blur. Filter, blur, Gaussian blur. And how far you blur it is a matter of your personal preference. So some people really like to create this sort of um, diffused uh, Vaseline on the lens look. Others, like me, I tend to like to have something where it's soft and painterly, but not too far. So you can see this image right now. If I hold Option on the Mac or Alt on the PC and click the visibility icon, the little eyeball next to background. And so it has this ethereal, ethereal nostalgic painterly quality to it uh, that is beautiful on its own. But if we apply the oil paint filter to this, we're going to get even more magic. So let me show you. I want to now take these layers here and I'm going, to, I'm going to merge them all into a new layer at the top of the stack. So what I did a moment ago, I'm going to repeat. Hold down Option or Alt on the Mac. I'm sorry, Option on the Mac or Alt on the PC and choose Layer Merge Visible. And that creates the merge layer at the top. Uh, this layer is going to get the oil paint filter, so we'll first convert it to a smart object with Convert for Smart Filters. And then we'll choose Filter, Oil Paint. All right, I won't bother changing any of the settings in here. I'll go with exactly what I had last time and press OK. This way we'll get kind of a nice apples-to-apples -apples comparison. To finish this process, I really love to, even though I'm not a painter, I dream of being a painter at night, you know, and um, I really love the idea of being able to paint light into your scene. And even as a photographer, you're going to find that the more you uh, spend time adding light selectively to a scene, the more you're going to be able to help move the, uh, the viewer's eye through the scene. And so I'm going to add this light by adding a levels adjustment layer. So I'll click right here on the levels icon in the adjustments panel. And I'm just going to drag this right hand slider over until things start to brighten up. And I'm going to go a little too far and then back it off basically setting things to as bright as I would possibly want them to be. And I'll, I'll go with right there, a little bit of brightening. Now, I, I want to isolate this brightening effect to just localized regions in the picture, so not the entire thing like we have right now. So that means I'm going to take this levels adjustment layer and temporarily hide it all together. And I can do that by filling the white mask with black. So I would choose Image, Adjustments, Invert, or Command or Control I, and that's going to flip the white mask to a black mask, meaning that the levels adjustment where I brighten things is temporarily hidden. 
Okay, now I'll grab the brush tool, and since my mask is black, meaning the levels adjustment is hidden, I want to paint with white in order to bring back that light to selective regions. So I might say, I'd like to add some light in here and in here, and I'll show you the net result of this in just a moment. But this is where you're, you are the painter in this, in this case, and you are choosing where you want the viewer's eye to go in the scene. So I'm painting over these areas with white paint on the black mask, which is essentially restoring the brightening effect of that levels adjustment layer in, um, or, or that levels adjustment layer that has a brightening effect on it. So let me just show you here. If I turn the visibility on and off, you can see here's before and here's after. So you see how you, I was able to bring light into those areas, and that adds dimensionality to the photo. I'm going to go ahead and pop back into the history panel and make another snapshot right now by clicking on this camera icon. And I'll show you in a moment. First of all, I want to show you where this image was before the oil paint effect and where it is now. All right? And I want to, now I want to show you what this looked like when we just ran the oil paint filter, which is this, versus when we did the soft low montage effect and then um, ran the oil paint filter and did a little selective painting with light after that. So um, not a dramatic difference between the two, but still you can see the difference. So whether you're a beginner who just wants to do oil paint and goes for this look or somebody who wants to dive a little bit deeper and go after this look, you can accomplish a beautiful oil painting effect with uh, relatively little effort in Photoshop. Does anybody have questions or thoughts about this? I like seeing both approaches, that's for sure. How about the rest of you? Anybody else? Um, <laughs> Well, there was the uh, entry level editing and then the uh, graduate level. So I'm happy to know that I can do the entry level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Mark, well, I would add, yeah. I was going to add two things. I was going to say I love the uh, selective painting the light into the, into the more sophisticated one uh, because I really think that's what a painter would do in the way they would mix up their pigments. They would pick brighter, warmer, more, more saturated colors to drive the eye to this tree branch, that leaf. I mean, that's what painters really do when they mix their, their uh, paint on the palette, that they don't just paint everything with the same green. They paint with a lighter green, a more, uh, a more saturated green. So I love that you really are, you know, I, I know you joke about dreaming of being a painter uh, when you sleep, but that really is painting right there. Uh, so I love that trick on top of the uh, the steps to make the montage. Uh, but yeah. I was also going to add for folks um, that that you went through an awful lot of buttons and steps there. Um, and uh, I know that you have video tutorials, articles, etc. for those who want to repeat those steps so they don't have to keep rewinding this show and trying to play it, pause, play it, <laughs> pause. Because uh, that was really cool. And I'm looking forward to trying that on one of my photos. Yeah, well, thank um, I you. I think, uh, David, that was um, a good, good comment there because in the show notes, we do, we'll have links to the tutorials that are specific to this show. So thank you so much for pointing that out. So anybody watching, you'll, you'll have a link uh, on the specifics. Yeah, I've got a, I have a free, uh, what I call a Photoshop workbench tutorial on this exact process. So you'll be able to just sit down with that tutorial and just, and just have a ball. Um, all right, well, I think then uh, what we'll do at this point is, is we'll move on to the last thing. How much time do I have, Cara? Well, we have about 15 minutes. Okay, and how much of that do I get? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll go real fast at the end, so you, you can have 12 of those. How's that? <laughs> Sounds great. I may not even need all, all 12. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. But uh, one comment about what you said, David, um, is if, you, um, if you're doing this luminous oil painting effect, it's great to be able to add that light. But everybody, keep in mind, you don't have to be doing this luminous oil painting effect to add light. In fact, you know, that, that's the master, Ansel Adams, in the dark room. He was... He was so good at his dodging and burning that he, he was able to move the eye directly through, through the scene exactly how he wanted. 
And uh, using the technique that I just showed there, uh, you can add light with a levels adjustment layer and the mask. You can add light to any photo that you have, whether you're doing this impressionistic technique or not. You, you might just add um, that in this particular image, you've got a very nice X composition. And I, I don't have a pointer, so I can't point to anything on the screen here. But you've got the white lines from the shoulder of the road coming in, and then they're picked up by the mass of the, of the two trees in the foreground and open back out again into this sort of X. And what you were doing with the light highlighting was just picking that up and subtly emphasizing it a bit, which made it a, even a stronger compositional element. And that's the kind of thing that a painter looks at too, is you're looking at the overall structure of the image and you're not, uh, with a very light touch, you can emphasize parts of some of the, like the foreground structure to reinforce that underlying compositional structure. And you did a very nice job of that in this, this example. That's a, that's a great point. And it's, it's really nice that somebody can actually articu articulate what I was doing. I, I don't even know if I was aware of it. So thank you. <laughs> for well, I take your... it back then. I take <laughs> it back. <if> you didn't <laughs> know <it's right. laughs> so now what I'm going to show you in this last technique is um, how you can take a photo and you can blend it with a texture to create something that looks impressionistic, painterly, beautiful. And um, there are so many creative right, possibilities. Just a little technical gremlin here. Um, do you all see the, uh, the, his screen, or do you just see his icon? I see his screen. You, you see his screen with the, his Photoshop open? Yes. Oh, OK. I all still, right. I still see screen, too. All right. On this, uh, on this end, we're, I'm just seeing the um, mark. OK, all right. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I, uh, you know, I, I hope for all of your sakes that you're able to see what I'm showing you here as opposed to my face, because <laughs> there's a serious advantage to looking at the photos rather than this face right here. So you don't, you know, if you catch my drift. <laughs> so um, anyway, we're going to montage, montage textures with photos. And, one thing I'm going to suggest, if, if you're interested in this, uh, is that you begin with a photo that has a very recognizable subject. And I'm going to just go through a few examples here um, to, sh to show you some montages that I've done. So here you can see there's a steeple and the, the overhanging maple tree, but the sky was washed out. And this is actually a perfect subject for multi-image montaging or texture montaging because uh, the lack of detail around the church in the sky region is what allows the texture to really shine through. And so I'll show you some examples. Um, you know, this is another example of that same steeple and the, the paint texture was actually pulled via a photograph off the side of the church. And, uh, and then I overlay the two to create this look that you see right here. Here we have, these are just fine grasses in a meadow uh, that have created the texture that you're seeing in and among those, uh, I don't know if those are asters or daisies, not sure what they are. This is um, a, a simple glass bottle with backlight coming, coming through a window and it was montaged with an image of ice crystals that I captured somewhere else. So I'll just slip through these and you can see that in each case you have a subject that is very recognizable. And around that subject is an area that is simple, uncluttered, doesn't have a lot of detail, and that really allows the textures to show up. And um, I do enough of this that uh, I've gone out and I've tried to find the best texture resources in, in the world, and um, there are a lot of great ones out there. Uh, I have a page on my site where I point you to my favorite texture resources. It's, um, uh, I think we'll have that in the show notes, although I'm not sure if I've given that yet to you, Cara, so I may have to pass that one on in just a bit. Anyway, so this gives you an idea. You can work with these different textures, blend them with your photos, come up with something that is unique, interesting, something that resonates with you personally as an artist. 
Hey, it's Carl Riley, and we're back for part two. We're sorry we had had an internet connection, my worst nightmare. The internet just shuts down in the middle of the show, but it was a clean break. We're here with Mark Johnson, Photoshop Luminary, and he had just shown his montages, and we were getting ready for his third example in uh, Photoshop. We've got Mike Berenson here with us, a night photographer. Off was off offering mini night tours. We've got David Marks with us from Montana, who also uh, teaches in Lightroom and has different tours. And we have Britta Brogge from Berlin, Germany, who has Show Your Best Shot. So uh, we're, you're turning in, and we're doing our part two, and the show must go on. And Mark, we're so happy that you're going to show us one more example of how to use Photoshop and create your own image, your own story with your photography. All right. <laughs> it's good to be back. In fact, since this is part two, does this constitute my third appearance on the landscape? There you go. <laughs> Three times a charm. This is awesome. <laughs> yes. Anyway, okay. So uh, anyway, when I left off, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, when I left off, uh, I was talking about montaging a photo with a texture. And I think I had just finished showing examples of of uh, what you can do with this. So let me actually take you through the creative process and uh, that means I'm going to open up um, this image of a misty barn taken in Asheville, North Carolina and then I'm going to open up an image of a texture. One thing I like to point out about this texture is that this is um, this is from my, one of my Texture Labs collections. Uh, I think it's Photographer's Collection One, and this particular texture is a seamless texture. And what that means is that you can tile the texture in Photoshop very easily. And I've got a tutorial on my site on how to do that. You can tile it so that it will cover a photo of any resolution. Um, in this case. I have plenty of, of size, plenty of resolution in the texture, so I'm going to go ahead and just open it up and go right into the montaging process without having to do any tiling. And let me show you how fast and easy it is to begin playing around with this creative process. So here's my texture. I'm going to do a select all and edit copy. And I'm going to pop over to the image of the barn and choose Edit Paste. So we're pasting the texture right on top of the barn. If you look in the Layers panel over here, you can see the texture is sitting right here as Layer 1. It's on top of the barn. So just a, a two-layer process. Now, we need to blend this texture with the underlying photo. And one way of doing that is with the Opacity slider. But I think the more powerful way of doing this is using the Blend Modes. And you can access the blend modes right here where it says normal at the top of the layers panel. Every blend mode behaves differently. So I like to think of this kind of my metaphor for this process. It's like um, when you're sitting there at your, your birthday table, you just blew out the candles, you get to open your gifts. Each one of these blend modes is a different gift. And each one is going to yield something uh, or, or a result that is very hard to predict. So the way to cycle through the blend modes rather than having to click and or scroll through them each time is to activate the move tool here and then hold down the shift key and tap plus so shift plus will cycle you through these blend modes now I'm gonna get muted as I do this so just know that I'm cycling through the blend modes each one's gonna have a different look when I arrive at one that I like I'll stop there and then I'll talk some more about it so here I go Okay, there it is. The one that I that I decided I liked best here is Overlay Blend Mode. Um, overlay is, I would say, it's the one I use most often, but I always like to cycle through all of the options so I can see what's possible because you never know what's going to happen. And uh, in this case, Overlay looks really great. I'm going to zoom this image up a little bit and let you see the detail here. 
So now you can see that the overlay blend mode with that particular texture is imparting a look to this that um, makes it look impressionistic. It's almost like the image uh, has been printed on some sort of uh, fine art paper. Different texture and image combinations are going to yield vastly different results. So I really encourage you to you know, find an image that has a clearly definable subject with an area around it that is not overly detailed. If the area around it isn't overly detailed, it'll really pick up the texture nicely uh, and, and you can produce something uh, that makes your spirit soar. In this case, I do want to show you one more little step associated with this. Sometimes you're going to find that the texture is a little bit too dominant in certain areas. And so if you want to kind of go in there, imagine going in there with like sandpaper and sort of sanding away the texture from certain areas so that it's not as dominant, what you can do is on the texture layer, you can add a mask. And as I mentioned in the uh, previous lessons, you can do that by clicking right here on this front-loading washing machine icon. So this has added my mask. And now the key to working with that sandpaper is to activate the brush, set black as your foreground color, and then paint with less than 100% opacity. You can see I have 50% opacity here. And I got to that very quickly by tapping 5 on the keyboard. Or, of course, you can scrub over the opacity uh, right here, and that will allow you to change the opacity as well. So now I'm going to paint over the barn. Just doing a very quick job of this. And you'll see that where I've painted with 50% black, Ask now has a 50% gray on it. And that means that as I turn the texture on and off here, you'll be able to see that it's fully visible out here. And in the barn area, we just have a subtle hint of the texture. So the idea here is, um, when you're working on this, you can just play around with different textures and photos, but also keep in mind that um, if you really want to go deeply into this process, you can try to find a texture that somehow complements or is a strong contrast to the photo, um, both visually but also in, in terms of what you're, the message you're trying to convey. So there's a whole bunch of possibilities once you begin blending textures. The last thing I want to mention is that if you're like I am and you love this process, it's really helpful to know where you can go to find great textures. And I have a post on my site. Um, I'll, I'll be sure to send this on to Kara so she can share it with everybody. But I have a post on my site where I share some of my very favorite texture resources. Um, because there are, there are a handful of sites out there that have absolutely incredible resources that you can use to just montage to your heart's delight. <laughs> so does anybody have any questions or thoughts about this? Well, this is this has been great. I, I would add, Mark, that um, the fun of textures has encouraged me to photograph things that I might have walked by otherwise, concrete, rocks, peeling paint, that I love getting textures from the Internet, but suddenly I find myself photographing things, random things, uh, burlap, canvas, because I might use them later for something. So it's really opened up a whole new avenue of, what I aim, what I aim my camera at, uh, to create puzzle pieces for when I get home. That's a great, a great point. I, I, um, I actually find some days when I'm, I'm maybe not in the mood to create, you know, uh, dramatic landscape shots or, or macro flower shots or whatever it is. When I'm not in the mood for that. Some days I actually go out um, and do what I call texturing, where I just take the camera out and I'll, all I'm looking for are textures. So I grab those up and then. I bring them home and I've got a nice filing system. I know since you're a Lightroom master, um, you would just do it with keywords. I do it with folders in, um, in Bridge, but I've got a, you know, I have a folder that represents all my textures and then I have subfolders that represent all of the different categories of textures that I've captured. Wow. Cara, you had something to say, I, I thought. Oh, I was just going to say, well, so, so Mike, uh, we'll get some stars for our texture. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have some star textures. <laughs> so you're gonna be in you're gonna be in Moab, right? Yes, yes. So uh, there's no shortage of textures in Moab. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, got you of... got a thousand varieties of sandstone to play with during the day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so 
<laughs> That'll be great. Well, Mark, we just want to uh, thank you so much for coming back for part two. This has uh, been very nice. I know you went through it, and it was a recording, so now here, here we got it, and we've got the capture, and we'll be able to get this to people right away. And I, I want you to know... Um, everyone that's listening, everything that Mark talked about, there will be links on the show notes um, so that you'll be able to get the free tutorials and some of the uh, information that he's provided. And he has some discounts this week. We're going to uh, have a link here for Mike and, and his uh, events and for uh, um, David and his events and Britta for her uh, theme page. Uh, and the show your best shot. So I want to thank you all. And now we're coming to the uh, part of the show where we share photographers to watch. And Mark, we're going to start with your photographer to watch. Um, and, uh, and this is your friend yeah. right here. <laughs> the and, image is uh, looking a little, um, little tiny bit squeezed right there. Of course, but, uh, I had to, uh, while we had the technical difficulties, whoa, what is up with this? <laughs> <laughs> we had the technical difficulties, I put the phone back on the hook, and then, uh, of course, it rang to talk, uh, to talk to David, but we'll get over these technical difficulties, get back to the task at hand, which is watching per, uh, wonderful photographers on Google Plus. So tell us about Lori, um, Mark, and your experience and what's been going on there. Yeah, well I, I wanted to share Lori today because uh, I think first and foremost Lori is just one of these wonderfully generous people who shares so much of herself and so much of her knowledge with others. Uh, I just I really want to present her for that reason alone. But it isn't, it isn't only that reason. She is a fantastic award-winning wildlife photographer and uh, the image that she has shared right here is of a baby gorilla from the San Diego Zoo and um, uh, I was just there with my five-year-old daughter about a month ago and uh, this is just an incredibly touching capture. If wildlife photography interests any of you then I really encourage you to go check out Lori. Um, you're going to appreciate both her photography and her spirit and her enthusiasm. And um, you were just featured, Mark, on, um, she, she um, featured you on, what was the uh, Google Plus Photographers, on, or Photographers she has, on Google she Plus? Has a, um, she's, she's on the Google Plus photo team, and she was generous enough to feature one of my articles about capturing unique flower portraits. She, she featured that on the, um, the Google Plus uh, photos page. And so we'll, we'll put that link on our show notes to, as well, Mark, because that was great. great. Okay, so now we'll go to the next shot. And uh, Britta, this is the photographer that you are telling us to watch. Yes, I'd like to introduce Luciano Cruz from Portugal. Um, I really love his photos. Um, they are so peaceful in a natural way um, with less or no editing. And of course, often he has very true words. I enjoy it. Excellent, excellent. So now we'll go to the next one. Um, we've got, okay, this is Jeff. Jeff uh, Bedeau had another appointment. And uh, did you want to uh, take this, David, or do you want me to roll with it? Uh, uh why don't you speak first, and then if I, I feel like something got, oh, got okay. forgotten, I'll pipe in too. Okay. Anatoly Urbanovsky uh, is just a very, very, very talented photographer. He shares so many uh, photographs with the landscape photography theme, uh, and we're just so happy that he does that uh, pretty much on a daily basis. And uh, so he, Jeff has included um, Anatoly to be in our circle of photographers to watch. So now the next one um, is Randy Bertrand and Randy was uh, participating in this Photoshop event 
and posting all kinds of lovely uh, photographs explaining how he got the star effect on the sun and just a lot of the techniques that he's been using. So he has some amazing shots and he was the photographer that I'm suggesting that go into our circle. Now we're uh, to David. Um, well, I, I picked uh, Royce Bear. Uh, B-A-I-R today, um, in part because I knew Mike would be here and I think that they have similar styles. Royce loves night photography and he loves uh, painting with light, using a, a flashlight to illuminate part of the scene. I, I don't think this particular image is actually his. I think this is one that he was featuring today. Uh, but oh. that's, that's great because, no, uh, that's great because what I was going to say is uh, I think one of the reasons to follow Royce is that he is one of the moderators in the night photography community and like you Cara or, or uh, like Britta he's very generous in promoting others whose work he finds inspiring and so I, I like to follow Royce not only because he takes great photos but because I feel like I feel like he's a curator uh, he's my doorway to a whole world of other folks uh, who are in night photography specialty like Mike, or who are in that part of the community? So I think he's definitely one that will that will open your eyes up to a whole slew of other great photographers as well. Thank you very much, uh, David. So You're welcome. Yeah. The, Crystal had uh, Brad McDowell um, as somebody to watch, and uh, this photograph just really reflects beautifully. Look at that light and and uh, the composition. So, Brad, uh, you'll be in our circle of uh, photo photographers to watch. And now we come to Mike. Mike, you're a photographer. This is a gentleman I've been watching for quite a few years named Brad Goldpaint. Um, I've been following him because I've been inspired by his photography, but um, also by his training approaches and a lot of the ways that he encourages his students and um, trains them and a lot of the techniques that he uh, shares with them and the outgoing nature that he has in sharing his techniques that he has that a lot of people honestly in, in the past may have kept things a little close to the vest and not been very uh, sharing of their techniques and I find Brad is really very encouraging in the community to be able to share those techniques among other photographers and to give each other encouragement and it's um, that combination of the two of them really has put him at the top of my list of people that I've been watching over the past several years and I, I highly recommend him for other people as well. Ah, oh, that's really nice. So the, just as you're closing up here, we'd like to let you know that our next show will be Tuesday, September 10th and Ray Billcliffe, who is the uh, curator for many um, themes on Google Plus, uh, Grass Tuesday, I believe, and light and all kinds of birds, and there's all kinds of things. Then on the uh, 24th, we will be having some HDR tips from the landscape photography curators. And then back on October 10th, Jeff Sullivan will be in sharing night photography editing. So um, I just want to come back here and uh, thank you all for um, <laughs> this second part in the phone ringing and uh, you know uh, just gremlins happen uh, and uh, Mike has uh, had a little uh, uh, animal from Rocky Mountain National Park that I really think I should start every show with and it's like this little person this little thing will show up so but Mark why don't you uh, end up here and tell us about your Nova Scotia trip that's coming up yeah I've got a uh, I have a workshop in mid-October in Nova Scotia which is a spot where I led a workshop la or two years ago with Charles Needle Charles and I are both um, really excited about creating impressionistic images and so um, we're hosting a, a workshop in a place where you have everything from rugged coastlines to spectacular lighthouses, fall foliage if we're lucky um, and then and some of the friendliest people you'll ever meet uh, are in Nova Scotia and anyway at this point in time I believe we have it's either three or four seats left for that workshop so I, I hope some of you who are listening will be able to join us.
Oh, that's great. That's great. So we'll get we'll have equal time here, Mike. Uh, you tell us about your uh, your two workshops. Sure, Mohawk you bet. In Rocky Mountain. You bet. We've got one workshop coming up in Arches National Park coming up just this Saturday. It's a multi-night event where we're going to be doing in-field instruction out in the field out in Arches National Park, one of my favorite locations in the world for photographers. And then we're also going to have two classroom sessions as well, both on post-processing and on planning and scouting. And then the following weekend, I've got a single night workshop in Rocky Mountain National Park. So for people who can't quite go the distance to Arches, it's a great place to go that's a little bit closer to Denver. But it's an action-packed night filled with, rock, filled with uh, lots of nighttime shooting. A lot of people look at the overnight as something they can't do because they don't have a sleeping bag or a tent. Well, it's not about sleeping. It's about night photography. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. And then, uh, David, you, you've got two coming up. I have two classes coming up in September. Uh, first, I'm headed to the coast of Maine, uh, a little south of uh, Nova Scotia, uh, in a month earlier. And uh, that, that's going to be a photography workshop at a lovely resort there where we will use their motorboat to go from island to island. Uh, we'll go to uh, Demaris Cove Island, which the basically the Nature Conservancy owns, a pretty remote island off the coast. We'll go to various lighthouses and lobster lobster pounds and lobster fishing. And so it's really a workshop about uh, photographing around the ocean, the, the shoreline of Maine. And then we'll motor back up to the resort uh, each night. And then a, uh, just a few days later, I hop on a plane to fly to Switzerland to uh, co-teach a class uh, facing the Matterhorn up in Zermatt uh, with, uh, with the, an English language photography school based out of Zurich uh, with my friend Matt Anderson. So we're going to do uh, an early fall at the Matterhorn class. Uh, and for anyone who's, who's watching or listening and on the other side of the ocean, um, I would love to have more folks in that one because I don't know when I'll be back in Switzerland again. That's uh, <laughs> a rare opportunity for me. Well, uh, thank you, so. thank you. Well, Britta, maybe you'll maybe you'll join them in Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Maybe, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thank you again, Please. and uh, good night, everybody. Uh, thanks for watching the Landscape Photography Show, and we hope to bring you photographers that you can connect with, learn with, and have fun with. So we'll see you on uh, September 10th uh, with Ray Gilcliffe. Thank you all, and good night. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Bye.